haunted city, a place inhabited by ghostly dreams of victory. This is Berlin on October 2nd, 1918, the day a German officer arrives at the Reichstag on a mission that will shake Germany out of its dreams. The courier is the Baron Erich von dem Busche, sent by Army Chief Ludendorff with a message that makes the victory propaganda suddenly meaningless. The German army is exhausted, the Reichstag is told. Reserves are used up. We cannot win the war. For years, the helpless captive of the army and its propaganda, the Reichstag is shocked. Some are incredulous. Some talk of suicide. But who can deny Ludendorff? A new liberal chancellor, the Kaiser's cousin, Prince Max von Baden, is appointed to carry out the army's new demand, to send out this message. The German government requests an immediate armistice on land, on sea, and in the air. It is a message addressed not to Britain or France, but to Washington, to President Woodrow Wilson, as Germany's best hope for a lenient truce. Armistice. After four years of havoc, the world can hardly bring itself to stop. While the leaders struggle with the idea of peace, troops keep moving toward the trenches. Five weeks will pass. A quarter of a million more Americans will sail for Europe before the engines of war can be shut down. Five last violent weeks before the guns stop firing. German headquarters on the Western Front, a resort in Belgium. Here in October 1918, Ludendorff waits for the message that he hopes will bring Germany peace by negotiation rather than by surrender. The first word from Woodrow Wilson amounts to a rebuff. No discussion until the German army pulls out of France and Belgium. Faced with an ultimatum instead of negotiations, Ludendorff reverses himself. To the Kaiser and Hindenburg, he urges, continue the fight, even against the rising tide of defeat. The rising tide in the Balkans. The Serbian army marching home with the Allies from Salonika, its leaders celebrating the end of three years' exile. The rising tide in the Middle East. Damascus, abandoned by the German-led Turkish army. Abandoned to Lawrence of Arabia and his desert cavalry. On their heels will come the Allied main guard, Allenby's British army victors in Palestine and now in Syria. Damascus, the prize of Arab rebel nationalism and the man Lawrence picked as its leader, Prince Faisal. sweeping away dreams of empire, the Kaiser's dream, Berlin to Baghdad. Allied warships will soon be sailing unchallenged through the Dardanelles, past the Turkish forts on Gallipoli. Beyond Gallipoli, where Allied armies suffered and failed three years before, and on to Constantinople. They will land as conquerors. Defeat looming in Italy, where the Allies are preparing to launch an offensive from the line of last year's disastrous retreat. Marching on Germany's closest partner, Austria. The Austrian army, battered, demoralized, surrendering by the thousands. The Austro-Hungarian Empire itself is crumbling from within. A riot of nationalism 
breaking its ties with everything Austrian, even the language. In Prague, a free republic of Czechoslovakia. The splendor of the Habsburgs reduced to caricature. The empire of the Habsburgs ended by proclamation. In Budapest, a free republic of Hungary announced by a socialist aristocrat, Count Michael Karolyi. A tide of defeat sweeping the Kaiser's block of central powers off the battle maps. Bulgaria, Turkey, Austria. The last front is the Western Front, and there an Allied combined offensive is in motion. British and Belgians in the north, French in the center. Americans aiming to close a giant pincers through the Meuse-Argonne. There will be no race to the Rhine, only a grudging German retreat. Retreat toward the frontier behind which Ludendorff counts on making a stand. Movement is slowest in the American sector, where the frontier is closest and the German escape route is threatened. But thousands of German soldiers choose a different avenue of escape, surrender. German army, wounds dressed in reused bandages, underclothes made of table linens requisitioned from home front hotels. The German army, drained by privation that is even worse for their families at home. With the advancing allies comes a tide of refugees returning to their villages, or what the Germans have left of them. This is the most poignant. Albert, King of the Belgians, returning to his country with the army he refused to surrender in 1914. With its grip on Allied soil loosening, its bargaining power all but gone, the German government decides to accept Woodrow Wilson's terms. The government, but not Ludendorff. And Wilson's own allies have their doubts. At Allied headquarters in Versailles, the leaders gather expectantly. Among them, President Wilson's personal deputy, Colonel House. The Allies are waiting to be brought in on Wilson's armistice negotiations, waiting in irritation and alarm. Anxious to destroy the German army, the Allies are afraid Wilson will settle for some mild political terms. The 14 points of world peace, enunciated in a Wilson